Well, this morning, um, we have a special guest with us this morning. Sorry about that. Um, guest this morning. Um, Superintendent Bruce Rhodes, who is the superintendent of the Southern uh, Michigan Conference for the Free Methodist Church. And uh, Superintendent Rhodes has served in that capacity for just over 10 years now, um, is that right? And um, he's actually been part of the Southern Michigan Conference for um, about 38 plus years. And uh, uh, Superintendent Rhodes is a graduate of Spring Arbor College. Um, and they're now Spring Arbor University. University yeah, yeah, so you're old. Um, <laughs> yes. So don't worry, because Lincoln and Christian. Just been reappointed. Yeah, Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln Christian College is now Lincoln Christian University. So there I get you it. Go. Yep. Um, and that's actually where uh, Superintendent Bruce met his wife, Gerilyn. And uh, uh, he uh, shared with me that he just is really blessed to have her as part of his life. They've been married for 41 years. Um, and together, they have three adult children who are all married. Um, and they have three of the world's best grandkids. Yes. And this is how you know someone's totally digging being a grandparent. They don't mention their kids' names. But their three grandkids' names are, are Wyatt, <laughs> Olivia, and Barrett. Thank and you. so um, at Superintendent Bruce says that his cup runneth over, and he loves Jesus and is blessed. So, thank you. Thank brother. you. Yes, thank you. thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I think this is on. Yes, good. Hey, it's great to be with you, Ferndale. Uh, it's a wonderful day. Uh, my wife and I enjoyed the 98-mile trip into Ferndale today. And uh, I don't know about you, but I love the fall. How many of you people uh, love the fall? How many of you people think it's way too short a season in Michigan, however? Isn't that true? <laughs> so get out and enjoy every day. Uh, you know, one of the most rewarding parts, uh, I think, of, of my role as a conference superintendent is when I get to come to one of the churches in our network and install a new pastor. So this is a big deal at Ferndale because Pastor Scott Gentry and his wife Leanna served here so beautifully for over three decades. Uh, but it's an exciting time in the life of the church too, right? Change always brings a certain level of excitement, and it's a, it's a time of continuity and discontinuity. Things change when leaders change. It's a time of stability. It's a time of change. It's a time where there's established vision in place, but there's also a new leader that brings new vision, and all of this kind of merges together at the moment when a new pastor is installed in leadership. So in my 10 years now as superintendent, I've done this a lot. <laughs> uh, most of the team that was in place when I started um, 10 years, 10 and a half years ago now, most of the teams have been flipped over. Uh, pastors have moved in, pastors have moved out, there's been retirements, unfortunately there's been a few tragedies as well. But here's what I know. In moments like this, when the baton is being passed and new leadership is coming into the church, it's a critical time in the life of the church. And so if you have any anxiety, uh, any concerns, any, well, you know, we're going to see what happens here. Here's, here's what I want to share with you. God's got this. Yeah. We just sang about his faithfulness, right? How many of you believe God's faithful? And true and good, yeah. He has good things in store. So in order to get off on the right foot now with this pastoral transition, let me encourage you to use your imagination. Uh, a white 3 by 5 index card. As soon as you've got that in your mind, raise your hand. <laughs> Just kidding. It wasn't too hard, was it? Now, what I'd like you to write in on that imaginary 3 by 5 card is what are the four descriptors that describe the nature of pastoral work? What four words, what four terms would you use to say this is what a pastor does? This is what like pastoral work uh, looks like here at the Ferndale Free Methodist Church. So as you start filling in your card and thinking about, you know, what are the four descriptors, the four terms, the four words, uh, I want us to draw our attention back again to this passage of scripture that was just read from Paul's Second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now, I would imagine if we would collect all these 3 by 5 cards right now and read every one off and tally, we would have a great deal of disagreement, right? There'd probably be 30, 40, 50 different answers, and there would be some great commonality. So what does God's Word say? How does Paul describe the nature of pastoral work. 
Well, uh, again, in his letter to a young pastor, Paul's acting like a conference superintendent because he appointed Timothy, his pastor, to oversee uh, a group of house churches that were all in the area of Ephesus. We don't know how many churches were in that network. We don't know how many churches Timothy oversaw, but Paul has clearly appointed him, and he's writing to him, encouraging him in his work. And in this particular letter that was written 2,000 years ago, isn't that crazy? You think we're looking at a letter that was written 2,000 years ago. Praise God that he seemed fit to keep his word consistent through two millennia. Um, we have some things that we can learn and that we can draw from. In other words, it doesn't matter what I think the nature of pastoral work is. And it really doesn't matter really what you think the nature of pastoral work is. This is God's word. And Paul is speaking very clearly about the nature of pastoral work. And if you notice in verse 7, he says, reflect on this. And that's what I want to do in the next few minutes we have together. Let's reflect on what Paul is saying to this young pastor, Timothy. So before we begin to examine the three descriptors or metaphors that he gives, I want to draw your attention to the first verse. And, oh, by the way, Rob, uh, this, this message is for you, and then, then it's for you. So we'll be going specifically words to you and specifically words to the congregation. So, Rob, I want to draw your attention to the very first part here. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Rob, your first leadership responsibility is to care for your own soul, <laughs> right? All of our public leadership as leaders in the church comes out of walking with Jesus personally. And Paul is very clear about this. He's not giving, he's not giving Timothy this list of things he has to do. He's telling Timothy, Timothy what he has to be. And a lot of times I think all of us in our relationship with Jesus, right, there's a subtle shift that can easily take place between being and doing, right? We work as servants of the Lord rather than as cherished sons and daughters. So uh, I think that Paul starts at the right place, reminding Timothy that he has a relationship with Jesus Christ and he's to take care of his soul in this relationship. Because when Timothy takes care of his soul and when Pastor Rob takes care of his soul, then he can take care of your souls. But he can't do that until he's squared away. And this, again, just the daily habits and weekly uh, and annual rhythms of life where we're enjoying God and learning to love him more and more. That's what Paul's talking about here. And then he introduces the first metaphor, teacher. Probably some of you put the word teacher on your three by five card. And if you did, good job. A pastor is a teacher. Rob, this first metaphor indicates that an essential ingredient to pastoral work is centered in orthodoxy, right? Orthodoxy. Now, at this time in the first century, we didn't have a New Testament uh, put together. We didn't have the canon of the New Testament like we have today. Early on, all apostolic teaching was oral, and it was anchored in the Old Testament, right? That's why when you read through letters in the New Testament, you see so many quotations from the Old Testament because the Old Testament was canonized. The New Testament was not yet formed. So that's why Paul says, the things you have heard me say, right? The word say. Paul was concerned that there'd be a consistency between his teaching and the teaching of Timothy, right? That orthodox teaching would be passed down. It would be faithfully replicated across the centuries. So according to this verse, Rob, your job is to take what you've received and pass it on to others, but that's not really the simple or the full picture here of what Paul's saying. Look deeply with me at this verse. According to this verse, you aren't just to instruct people. You are to instruct instructors. Note the four generations mentioned in this cycle the things that you have heard me, that's Paul, say. The things you, Timothy, have heard Paul say. Timothy is to entrust to reliable people. And what do they do? Because they're reliable people, they're qualified to teach others. So let's get to the point here. Orthodoxy is not the end goal. Does that sound heretical to some people? Orthodoxy is not the end goal. Orthodoxy, if not merged with personal example, is sterile. 
Faith without works is dead. If good teaching doesn't inform right living, it's just orthodoxy. <laughs> so that's why your personal example is so important to the authenticity of what you teach week in and week out. Either Paul wrote to Timothy, uh, earlier Paul wrote to Timothy, set an example for the believers, right? In speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. In another verse, Paul said, watch your, uh, your life and doctrine closely, because if you do, you'll save not only Rob, but you'll save your hearers, right? So this is such an important piece of what Paul's after here as he develops his young pastor. Uh, persevere in these things, he says. So be sure that the way you live your life is in alignment with the truth that you speak. Now, when you do that, when that happens, the outcome of this generational impact takes place. Multiplication automatically takes place because this is in place. So take your preparation time seriously. Guard it well working on my dissertation on Friday, right? I've got to turn my email off <laughs> so I can do my study well. Uh, remember that spiritually anointed messages have generational impact. God's word does not return void. So here's a word to the congregation. One of my favorite proverbs in the Old Testament book by that name is this, sitting in a chicken house doesn't make you a chicken. Okay, so it really doesn't say that. <laughs> uh, the truth behind the proverb, though, is this. In the same way that sitting in a chicken house doesn't make you a chicken, sitting in a pew doesn't make you a Christ follower. Friends, God has so much more for us than what we often recognize in terms of how he wants to grow us and use us in the expansion of his kingdom. If the pastor is to be teaching so that multiplication is happening and new disciples and leaders are emerging, then guess what? You are those new disciples and leaders. <laughs> you need to be emerging. And I'm convinced after doing this job for 10 years and talking to a lot of leaders and a lot of levels within the Free Methodist Church, one of the shifts that needs to take place in the American church is people need to move away from thinking about attending the church to actually being the church. This is easy. <laughs> being the church out of these walls and impacting these communities is not easy. Some of you are here today, and you're like an unopened gift. And God has a call upon your life and mine to go beyond sitting in a pew to getting involved in the expansion of his kingdom in the world. There are people probably in this church right now who have been called to be deacons in this church. God wants to raise you up to bring blessing to this church. There are people who are sitting in these pews right now that probably have shepherding gifts that could shepherd a small group of people in their own homes and love them and faithfully point them to Jesus. There are future pastors and church planners in this congregation. You don't have to be ordained to plant a new expression of church, do you? <laughs> uh, there are people in this church with mentoring gifts who can come alongside of younger Christians and develop and disciple them. We don't have to hire that. All of us can do that. Amen, church? So I believe that every church in our network should be multiplying new congregations because multiplication is clearly what God's after. God created everything that multiplies. Even our universe is still expanding, friends. Think about that. God said, <laughs> right, the first commandment, be fruitful and multiply. So teaching, here's the second one. Soldier, anybody put soldier on their card? <laughs> Join with me in suffering like a good soldier, Paul said to Timothy. About 10 years ago, our oldest son, Daniel, was stationed in uh, Afghan, Afghanistan's Helmand province. Uh, he was in an advanced unit, tip of the spear, during the troop buildup of the, uh, the Obama administration. We heard from him three times in seven months. A week or two after they got there, two of his friends were killed by an IED. Every day, I would get up and watch the morning news and hear how many Marines had just been killed the day before. And it was a horrific time in our life. 
when Daniel called for the first time, I said, Daniel, what's it like? He said, Dad, the enemy's at 270 degrees of our forward position and we're being fired on every day. Those are not the words that Dad wants to hear. Uh, being in an advanced position means you don't get laundry service <laughs> and there are no food trucks. <laughs> And so we would literally pack a USPS boxes. I think they were $10. We'd get a box like that. We'd put Chef Boyardee ravioli. He loves it. Don't ask me why he does. Uh, socks, underwear, because the Marine Corps couldn't furnish them with fresh underwear. They would wear underwear until it literally peeled off their bodies. So, but the United States Post Office could deliver underwear, so that, I don't understand that. It's just like the Chef Boyardee thing. God brought him home safely, and we're so thankful. But here's what I know. That was tough. Combat in Afghanistan during the troop buildup in an advanced position was something to endure, and those Marines suffered. They suffered. So, Rob, I hope you're finding encouragement that Paul's saying to beat your soldier. <laughs> <laughs> So this idea of soldiering and pastoral ministry, Paul's putting them together. Let's unpack it. Let's reflect on it. Rob, you must outwill and outlast the enemy's assault on your leadership role as a pastor. You just got to go to work every day, right? This is one of the reasons why Paul gave Timothy instruction to take care of his soul. There's a strength to ministry when our souls are well, <laughs> And the better you care for your soul, the more soldiering you're capable of, the more you're able to endure. At times it'll seem overwhelming, I'm sure, I've been there. A uh, barrage of criticism or misunderstanding or disagreement that takes place when you want to bring some new initiative or some new idea, right? People don't quite get it off the front end. And sometimes our leadership does come underneath attack. All leaders that lead come under attack. That's just the way it works. So be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you. Now, word of the congregation, I want to get you uh, in touch with verse 4 here, where it reads that a soldier doesn't, quote, get entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. What does that mean for the congregation? Well, let me say this. Pastors are appointed to churches. They are not employees of churches. Pastors have a commanding officer, and his name is Jesus, the Lord of the church. <laughs> and pastors must please Jesus first. And sometimes, sometimes a pastor is placed in an awkward place <laughs> where they're trying to please their commanding officer, Jesus, and they want to make their congregations happy. And you sometimes can't do that at the same time. Sometimes you just can't do that. So let us be clear. It is always in the best interest of the church when a pastor pleases Christ first. So make sure that you are clear about that, right? Ours is a day of opinion polls. Earthly leaders sniff the political winds to figure out how they ought to root their leadership decisions. That doesn't ruffle too many feathers. This is not the language that Paul using that is indicative of pastoral ministry. Pastors aren't politicians. Pastors are soldiers, nature of pastoral ministry is soldiering under the lordship of Jesus, and he serves as the commanding officer. Here's the third word, athlete. Athlete. Did you put athleticism on your three-by-five card a few moments ago? Is athleticism critical to pastoral work? Well, it is. So, Rob, pastoral ministry should have the smell of the gym about it. <laughs> It requires physical and mental toughness. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, we just looked at this, where he said, train yourself to be godly. The word train is a Greek word, gymnos. We get the word gymnasium. I think it was Kent Hughes in one of his books talked about how ministry has the smell of the gym about it, right? Uh, that we're working at something diligently. The word train, okay, that, that means athleticism. Now, sometimes we train hurt. And I want to talk real quickly about two types of common encumbrances to pastors today. The first is the running injury of personal hurt. During the Atlanta Olympics, some of you, if you're old enough, 
And I'm finding the more I speak, the less people are familiar with this story, but I'm going to share it anyway. 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia, gymnast Carrie Strug inspired the world after badly injuring her ankle when she performed a vault exercise. Going into the final round of the vault with a gold medal on the line, she under-rotated her landing on her first attempt, causing her to fall and badly sprain her ankle. Do you remember this? In order to mathematically clinch the gold medal, Carrie would have to vault again, and this time she'd have to stick the landing despite her injury. The world watch, I remember watching this. Matter of fact, I looked it up the other day and watched it again. It's truly amazing. The world watch, one of the most dramatic moments in Olympic history, as Carrie bravely ran down the mat full tilt, vaulted, subsequently stuck her landing on both feet, earning her a 9.712 score, ensuring that the women's team won the gold medal in the 96 Olympics. She received the victor's crown. Rob, <laughs> man, you're going to have to stick the landing, even when it hurts. And sometimes I can tell you, uh, leadership is painful. And you know this, it's not your first rodeo either, but it's a good reminder for us all. Sometimes it's just painful, but you got to stick the landing. The second one is the excess weight of worry. Uh, I think I probably live here more than I used to. Uh, anybody know that a pandemic happened a few years ago and everything just seemed to change, right? I mean, wow. A worry. Leaders, because they feel responsibility, sometimes bring upon themselves unhealthy worry. Don't allow your mind to become preoccupied with all that you must do in the days ahead at the cost of being fully present to what the Lord is saying today. Man, that's so important. One of the best pastoral practices to help us rise above the crushing weight of worry is reflection. One of the things that my wife and I love to do, and we're going to be missing it the colder it gets, but I have in my life what's called the discipline of porch setting. We have a lovely porch, look out on a big field, drink my Starbucks coffee in the morning, and spend probably an hour on the porch, and just be quiet. <laughs> Never surrender your joy to the pressure of worry. Word to the congregation, some years ago, my wife was running 5Ks. She just kind of got this uh, bug to start running more. She's always been a good runner. And we were at Somerset Beach Camp. A lot of you know where that's at, down in Hillsdale County. And I wanted to run with her that day, but somebody needed to take the picture. So anyway, the race began and off they went. And I could take a shortcut to the one-mile uh, watering station, the watering station. And when the runners come around the corner to the watering station, you're taking cups of water and you're holding out, and you're cheering them on, and they're, you know, splashing, splashing, drinking, throwing, they litter. They're really pigs when they do that. But anyway, a watering station is a place where thirsty runners get two things. One, water. Second, encouragement. And I remember that day, and this was, man, 10, 12 years ago, and I felt the Lord say to me, this is what every church needs to be like. A place full of living, fresh, cool water and lots of encouragement. And how much so for pastors today. In some ways, I think this is a great metaphor for the environment for a pastor in a local church. So friends, do what you can to offer lots of refreshment to this thirsty leader. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. 1 Thessalonians 5.12. So be sure that you're rich with your words of encouragement and careful with your comments. <laughs> the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. The last descriptor is that of a farmer. 
Rob, God has placed you as the farmer here now. <laughs> Your job is to cultivate this congregation, congregation and produce a crop of healthy, thriving disciples who will in turn, some of which leaders will emerge, who will begin new works of God in and around this community. So as you embark on this leadership journey here, remember Paul's words to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. So you have a powerful partner in this farm. <laughs> Very powerful. Partner with him. Partner with him. As you work the farm called the Ferndale Free Methodist Church, plant lots of kingdom seed and water and fertilize those seeds with love and truth and grace. And don't allow anything hostile or invasive onto the farm. I know a little bit about that because I garden. Uh, you've got to stay diligent about the invasive stuff that doesn't belong in the patch <laughs> and keep after it. And the word to the congregation, pastoring's a difficult calling. There are lots of difficult jobs. I, I wouldn't say it's the most difficult in the world. I just know it's a difficult job. One of the reasons why this is true is because churches have a lot of different expectations of their pastors. Uh, some of you will expect Rob to be like Pastor Scott. That's just not fair. Don't do it. Throw that one away. That's a bad idea, right? Um, our polity as Methodists are when the bishop reads the appointment of all of our pastoral team each year at the conclusion of an annual conference gathering. At the bottom of the appointment sheet, it's a literal physical sheet, all the churches are listed alphabetically, but the pastors and the staff that are appointed there, there's this wonderful statement at the bottom that reminds your lay delegate and your pastor of the fact that pastors are not just appointed to a congregation but to the community that congregation is called to serve. So pastors have three primary plots or fields that I think they must be pastoring in. All three of these fields Jesus farmed in, by the way. The first is the leadership field. Jesus spent significant time with 12 disciples and even more specific, intentional time with just three, James, John, and Peter. He did this to disciple and prepare them for leadership in his church. Likewise, your pastor must invest time in the personal formation and leadership development of a small group of people here that God is raising up as leaders. That's the leadership field. The second is the field of this community. Jesus spent a lot of time working the larger field, didn't he? I mean, we just read through the Gospels. Jesus traveled from village to village, and from countryside to countryside. There were times when he was immersed in a sea of human need, but he always withdrew from the crowds and that context in order to care for his own soul and to commune with the Heavenly Father. And when he was fueled up, then he went back out. Your pastor needs to be in this community, not just this community. And then the third field is the congregational field. Jesus spent time with the crowds, which is an equivalent to the congregation. He convened them, taught them, fed them, blessed them, healed them, pastored them. This is the third field that a pastoral farmer works in, the, in following the pattern of Jesus. And by the way, this is a co-op garden. <laughs> All of us are called to roll up our sleeves and get in the work of the soil here, right? The work of planting and sowing and nourishing what God wants to grow here out of this congregation. Everyone gets to play a part Everyone enjoys the beauty and the bounty of the harvest. Well, this speaks to just this announcement Pastor Rob made just a few moments ago. He's saying, hey, there's this field called online. <laughs> people who are watching a service online. And he's saying, hey, are there people here who are going to get in that part of our garden and do some work? So I charge you, Rob, Care for your soul, brother. 
and I charge you, Ferndale Free Methodist Church, to care for your pastor. <laughs> and see what God, what great thing God has in store in these days ahead with the new pastor leader at Ferndale. So we're going to transition right now into the installation service itself. And I'm going to ask Pastor Rob and his wife, Ruthie, if they would come forward right now and meet me down here on the platform, on the main floor, I should say. And um, we'll actually do the installation work now. Dear friends in Christ, Pastor Rob has been appointed to minister as a lead pastor in the life of this congregation. We gather now to install him into this position and to pray fervently for his effectiveness. Jesus called James and John from the care of their fishing nets, Matthew from the tax collection booth, Priscilla and Aquila from their livelihood in Rome. All these and others besides them have been chosen by God to serve his people and enlarge his kingdom on earth. And God has been pleased to endue his servants with gifts suited to that task. He granted Bezalel the, guilt, the skill to fashion gold and silver. Upon Joshua, he bestowed the gift of military leadership. Upon Isaiah, he poured out a spirit of prophecy. In the days of the apostles in our New Testament, he empowered them to preach, to heal, to administer, and to evangelize, all for the glory of his name. We approach, therefore, this hour with confidence that he's appointed Pastor Rob to carry out a ministry of pastoral leadership and that he will provide all the grace needed for the work. So, Rob, I have four questions to ask before I install you, and I remind you if any of the answers no, we got to start all over, so please say yes, all right? <laughs> we have good faith that the answers are well, well in hand. Rob, will you be fervent in prayer, faithful in service, and diligent in bringing people to Christ? Yes, I will. Will you be thorough in your preparation to teach and preach, proclaim the Word of God with honesty, clarity, and love, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I will. Will you accept this ministry with dependence upon God for its fulfillment? Absolutely, yeah. I will. Yeah. Will you nurture the gifts you've been given and the skills you have acquired and use them to advance our Lord's kingdom within and beyond this congregation? Yes, I will. All right. Let's have you and Ruthie kneel right here. And uh, I want to invite those who, who would love to come and join with the laying on of hands. We're going to lay hands upon them right now and uh, commit them to the Lord in prayer. Come forward, please. Just reach out and lay hands on the person in front of you. Or just extend your hand if you'd like. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are here. Yes. You, Through the ministry of your spirit. We have gathered together in the name of Jesus. The presence, the spirit of Jesus is here. And we have opened up and turned our hands upward to heaven. Asking you to pour in to this, your servant, Pastor Rob and his wife, Ruthie, your Holy Spirit, your breath, your life, your wisdom your power. God, pastors today uh, have a lot of voices telling them what to do, how to do it, when to do it. We pray that you would tune their ears to hear your voice above all others. To have, Lord, uh, a sense of the very clear leading of Jesus in the decisions which lie ahead. We pray, Lord, that you'd give them uh, hearts that are tender and minds that are sharp. Yes. And, Lord, that they would receive such a unique anointing of God for the task of leadership here at the Ferndale Free Methodist Church. Lord, we know that the world has changed. <laughs> and, Lord, we have a sense that you want to birth new things. And Lord, we confess as your people that we're not often comfortable with new things. So we pray also for this congregation 
that they might, uh, Lord, just kind of open up, not grip things so hard that they're not willing to let go of what you're calling them to let go of because then they can't embrace what you're calling them to. Lord, change is on the way, whether we like it or not, but we want to be led by the Spirit of God with conviction. The world needs a church that is on fire with the presence of the living God. This community needs a community of believers who are filled with the Spirit of Jesus. Lord, you do big things. (laughs) You are able to do abundantly more than what we could ask or imagine. And so, Father, we give ourselves to the work you've called us to, but, Lord, more importantly, to the relationship you've called us to, or from that, the work flows. Do a new work here at the Ferndale Free Methodist Church. Bless this new pastor and his wife and their family as they give faithful leadership to the people of God and all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you.